All right, everybody. Well, thank you for being here. This is Resolving Family Conflict presented by International College of Ministry um, and your local Chevy dealer. No, just kidding. Lord, thank you for tonight, and we just praise you, Father. We love you, Lord. Just ask you to guide us through this by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, Ellen's going, can you two talk the normal people? Can I, what? Can you two talk the normal people? I'm not sure. I'll try. Um, hello, Dolly. Looking good, Dolly. You're looking swell, Dolly. So nice to have you around. So let's get on what we're talking about. Ronald Reagan said something interesting. He said a lot of interesting things before he, you know, got Alzheimer's. He said, peace is not an absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, okay? Um, such a wise man. He had strange hair, but a very wise man. If you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, you probably didn't think he was very wise. It kind of depends on your take there. In every family, there's just that one especially difficult person. And usually when there's a conflict, there's always that one guy or that one girl that is just, you know, the hard case. The one that, uh, the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, so to speak. Um, the, the dog that barks the loudest. The one that's uh, either in the crisis or the control freak or the one that's making the most noise or causing the most stress in the family. Everybody has one, and I'm really going to focus. It's such a huge topic. I want to focus in on dealing with that difficult person in your family. I'm also, I'm not talking tonight about conflict with teenagers or conflict with kids. I'm talking about conflict between adults tonight. So I want to get that, make sure everybody, you know, sees that clearly. I'm talking about conflict between adults and what we can do to resolve that conflict. Um, working with teenagers and working with young people is a whole nother issue and we just don't have time to get into all of that. But there's always that one person. It seems like the difficult family member gets the center of attention. It, it seems like everybody centers on them. I've noticed over the years that you can have a, any large group of people and there will be one or two in the minority who tend to cause the problems and whoever the problem maker is, is the one that gets the focus. And it's amazing. I, I've noticed this with churches, with schools, with families, um, that one troublemaker gets an inordinate amount of, of attention, where the people who are not causing problems, just kind of trying to, to live and exist and get along peacefully, usually get none of the focus. It's kind of sad that the attention has to go to the problem child, so to speak. But Every family has them. Um, you know, I'm from the South and uh, born and raised in Tennessee and live quite a bit in Mississippi. And, and there's a saying in the South that goes, uh, you know, he's just kind of special. <laughs> and every family has that, that special one, you know, that aunt or that uncle or that, that, that difficult one. So if you're in the South and you're called special, Jim Drake, it's really not a compliment, okay? I just want to make sure you understand that, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, th these people are the ones that, that, that stay wound up tight. You know, they're the ones that, that's just constantly stressed. You can, you can go to a, a Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas or any family gathering, and you look at the one who's really stressed out. Usually, they're the control freak. That's a whole giant topic. Check out our video online. We've got a video on YouTube called Dealing with Controlling People. We actually have part one and part two. Uh, very excited about that video, by the way. We just, I was just looking at it the other day. We have over 83,000 views on that video. But there's that person in the family that's trying to run the show, that's trying to, they believe they have the right to be right because they are right. They think they know what's best for everybody to do, and they're going to make it happen. They're going to manipulate. They're going to use guilt. They're going to use shame. They're going to use condemnation. They're going to use whatever weapon they can. It can be, it can be subtle. It can be passive aggressive. It can be aggressive. But whatever, they're the ones that just seem to, you know, every time you have that family get together, they're the one that, uh, adds just a little, uh, 
you know, it put a little salt in the wound. And they're the ones that just stir things up. And you go, oh, no, here we go again. Oh, do they have to bring that up? Oh, can they not just be happy? Will they please stop complaining? What is, oh, no, here we go again. Uh, what, what is going to upset them now? But I think every, I've seen this so many times, every family seems to have that person. And then there's conflict. And then there's there's conflict because they're making the family miserable. They're they're causing they're causing issues in the family. They're upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. And you know you have to deal with them. Now the principles I'm going to share tonight. It may not always be about that control freak who's wound up tight. There may just be a, a family member who that you you've struggled with and you need to to resolve a problem with. We're going to talk about that. Okay. All right. Um, what do we got here? Uh, Steve said, we used to say that was stirring the pudding. Yeah, <laughs> stirring the pudding. That's a very nice way to put it, I would think. Amen. So uh, anybody got in their family that kind of looks like this guy here? I don't know. Let me get my little my little tool on here. Uh, I don't know. There he is. A little marker around him. He just kind of, I kind of like this guy. It reminds me of several people that I know. Nobody listening to this video, though. Nobody at all. Nobody at all. The typical reaction of other family members is to make peace at all costs. Okay? Whatever the cost, let's just have peace. And so what happens in families is people tend to to figure out, you know, ways, and I'm going to talk about the ways people do it, but let's just have peace. Well, the problem is with having peace with a difficult person in the family the problem is this. The problem is, what is the cost? What does it cost you to have peace? Okay. And what does it cost you not to have peace? What is, what is the cost of continuing the road that you're continuing? Or what is the cost of maybe having a resolution to this problem? I know everybody here listening to me it probably has unresolved issues with family members. You know, I, I'm a very prophetic person, and um, I try to hear uh, from the Lord as much as possible. And if you were to come to me and say, I, I never have any problems with any of my family members, I'd have a word for you. It would be, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> we all do. Amen. <laughs> I don't know. You know, most families have some level of dysfunction in them. My family was so dysfunctional, we used to put the fun in dysfunction. I, I looked at the Bible. One day somebody pointed out to me and said, Hey, Dr. Self, did you notice that there was not a normal family anywhere in Scripture? And I thought about it. And I kept thinking, well, let's look at some of the families in Scripture. Was there a normal family in Scripture? Let's see. Sarah and Abraham. Yeah, that's, that's pretty normal. Yeah, you know, this 120 years old having babies, you know, pretending to that she's your sister and this kind of stuff. But then you go to Adam and Eve, talking to snakes, trying to be like God, you know, walking around full of shame and guilt and blaming each other. Oh, how about David and Bathsheba? That's a pretty normal relationship, don't you think? You know, the reason they called her Bathsheba, because David, you know, wanted her when he saw her taking a bath. Um, how about, um, <laughs> oh, how about... It's getting close to Christmas time. How about Joseph and Mary? That's a very normal family, wouldn't you think? Let me get this straight, Mary. You're pregnant, but we've never touched each other. That's pretty normal, don't you think? Anyway, the point is, uh, I haven't really met too many perfectly normal families. And if you if you know one, please point them out to me because I I think we should take them to the Smithsonian Smithsonian Institute and make them into an exhibit. All right, <laughs> amen. So if you're not really taking care of it, my question would be, how is your solution with your family working out so far? You know, how, how's it going for you? You know, you've got this troublesome family member and it's been going on for years. And so far, you know, everything you've tried just hasn't been working. You know, it's like, so how's, it, how's, it, how's your present solution working for you? That's a good question. 
insanity to find. Doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. So maybe tonight, uh, and I say this with all humility, is maybe we can come up with some different ideas on how to resolve family issues. Some of us have worked with the same family issue uh, for years and years and years and years. Why don't we maybe try something different tonight, okay? Okay? Uh, yeah, avoidance and disconnection, yeah. How's that working out for you? <laughs> How's avoidance and disconnecting? Doing, <laughs> yeah, working out good for you there, Jim? Yeah, I mean, um, the avoidance, uh, I've tried that quite a bit. The appeasement, tried that quite a bit. Um, hasn't worked so well, you know, but, but I've done it over and over and over again, so obviously I must have a little insanity. Don't go there. Okay. Here's my warning tonight. You're not going to be able to fix your family member. See, there. here's the deal in a nutshell. We have that person in our family that drives us crazy. They offend us. They upset us. They are not fair. They don't speak correctly. They're disrespectful. Whatever the issue is, okay, we want to resolve it because we want to fix them because we don't like the way they act and the way they make us feel. So therefore, we want to fix them so we don't have to feel what we feel. And it's a really poor motivation. Let me ask you some questions, listeners. What's the problem with trying to fix a person? What's the message? when you try to fix another person. Does anybody here want to be fixed? Unless you're a dog. <laughs> sorry. That's really bad. I had my Wheaties today. I'm sorry. What's the problem with trying to fix another person? Control. Control. Controlling. Uh, and Steve said uh, domination, control, judgment, condemnation. Feeling superior, very good. If I try to fix Jim Drake, and, and I want to tell you, he's the third window here, and I know Marsha's tried to fix him for years, but the problem is, if I try to fix Jim Drake, what I'm doing is I'm implying that he's broken, and I'm not. I'm putting myself in a superior position. See, God has never called us to try to fix another person. Never, ever, ever. As a matter of fact, when you, you, you guys have hit it all over the place, uh, feeling superior, they're not, uh, they're not good enough, doing God's job, you're all over it. You're all over it. You can even get into control, domination, manipulation, and then you're stepping into witchcraft. That's what the spirit of witchcraft is. Trying to fix another person is one of the worst things you can do. Instead of fixing, God has called us to do something completely different. He's called us to serve to love, and to serve another person. So our attitude is the attitude of a servant trying to help and serve instead of a uh, carpenter trying to repair them. Okay? Amen. Um, fixing is a job that belongs to God. We're, we're not repairmen. We are, we are servants of the Most High God, meant to, to lovingly, help our neighbors, to help our friends, to help our family. Okay? Amen? Amen. There are four possible solutions. Now, before I get into these possible solutions, I mean, I've got a pretty good crowd here tonight. Does everybody, anybody here have some family issues or family conflict going on or unresolved conflict? Anybody besides me? Anybody? Am I the only one? I don't believe so. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Well, nine and I. Oh, okay. Liz, too. Amen. Okay. Well, good. I don't feel so lonely. Jim, you don't have to speak. I already know about yours. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. We do. Well, there's four things. Now these are now these are very broad areas that we're going to get into. Okay. There's four things you can do. Three of them. Eh, three of them not so good. Let's look at one thing you can do. Uh, Ellen says, my family would choose me ever since I received the Lord. I've been the different one. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. You are the different one. You're, you're out of this world. You're of the kingdom of God. 
the first thing we can do is to continually appease or yield to that person. Um, that's pretty much what we did in my family. And I want to tell you from experience, it doesn't change a thing. As a matter of fact, appeasement is a lie. Let me say it again. Appeasement is a lie. It's, it's, you're lying. Well, I don't want to deal with it. Well, you're lying because you're not being truthful with what you think. You're not being truthful with what you feel. Uh, you're going along with something you don't agree with. Uh, it, there's no transparency there. Uh, it, it, it's a temporary peace. It's a temporary satisfaction. It's a very short-term solution to a long-term problem. And again, it's not honest. And it doesn't work. And um, you know, I've got a, a family member in the Tennessee area that has just uh, been almost a, a thorn in my side and a torment for years. And um, many times I'm tired. I just don't want to face it. I don't want to deal with it. So I just go along with them. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, sure, we'll do it. Yeah, whatever you want. Fine. Hey, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I'll be there. Whatever. And all it does is enable. All it does is take away consequence and responsibility. You see, God's not an enabler, and he doesn't expect us to be enablers. See, en enabling is, is robbing people of their natural consequence. And when you rob somebody of their natural consequence, many times you get in the way of God. Let me say it again. When you take away a natural consequence of somebody's bad behavior, or you rescue them or appease them, then many times you're in the way of what God was trying to do with that person. Hmm. Chew on that one for a little bit. Okay. Uh, it feeds it. It does. That's does, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Tried that one. Amen. Steve said, thank you, Liz. Steve says, wouldn't you say that, that some family members shy away from people fixing to such a degree that they enable the person's behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely they do. Absolutely. Now, fixing, again, is not, is not the answer. Serving in a godly way, we'll talk about that more to come, is a little bit better solution, a whole lot better solution. Number two, you can appease. You know, appeasement means, yes, dear. Okay, whatever. We go along with it. But number two is avoid it. You don't pick up the phone. You just try to stay away from them. In other words, you hide. Okay. Uh, it's a family gathering for Thanksgiving. You stay in the other room. You just avoid them. You avoid conversations. You avoid, um, you avoid talking to them. It's not that you don't love them. It's just that you don't want to deal with it. How's that working out for you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Ellen said, uh, don't we want to fix people so our lives are easier? Don't I need to deal with the problem? Well, we do need to deal with the problem. But see, fixing people so we will feel better is not really a good solution. And it's not even, a, we'll talk about this. That's not a good motivation. Fixing is never a good motivation. Fixing is a terrible message. The moment you try to fix somebody, you're implying they're broken. You're not. They're below. You're above. You're superior. They're inferior. It's all kinds of messages. It gets into control. It gets into just a whole mess of stuff. Um, I don't know what one person here that wants to be fixed. Okay. Helped? Sure. Served? Sure. Um, um, you know, a lot of things we want to do. We want to be encouraged, edified, absolutely. Okay. I think I accidentally hung up the phone here. No, I didn't. Okay. Amen. Now, so avoid is another one thing we can do. Just duck, duck it, you know, hide our heads in the sand. Or I love this one. I like my graphic. We can fight to win. Amen. We can knock them out. We can prove they're wrong. We can show this person how right we are and how wrong they are. We can out-debate them. We can out-argue them. We can show the world that they're incorrect and you are correct. We can prove your rightness and we can prove their wrongness. That works really well for relationships, don't you think? <laughs> 
Don't you think that works well for relationships? You know, you know, knocking them out, you know, proving how great you are. Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea to build healthy relationships, don't you? If you could see the tongue in my cheek, you could see, you would see my cheek sticking out like this, or, or, or tongue in my cheek. Um, <coughs> I think we need the dog whisper to fix some problems. Yeah, maybe so. Fight to win is terrible. Probably of the of the three solutions I've, I've mentioned, it may be the worst. Proving that you are right, proving that they are wrong does nothing but destroy relationships. Well, in a conflict, we're not out to destroy a relationship. We're not out to prove right and wrong. Again, it's not the solution. Um, it's a terrible way. It is a terrible way to resolve conflict. You may be right. You may have all the logic in your corner. They may be wrong, and you can prove them wrong. And let me tell you something. You can go ahead and do that. See how it works with your family. See how much the conflict goes away. It will not go away. You think this guy laying on the canvas there is happy about being knocked out? Got a couple of other comments. Uh, Randy Stonehill once wrote, Steve says, choose your battles carefully. There's so few that were worthwhile to wage. Yeah. Uh, Jim writes, some just love to fight, to feel superior. Yeah, we do. And normally, to me, and I don't want to be dishonest with you, fight to win is great for people with inferiority complexes. When you have a low self-esteem, you will want to win because your ego needs to be proven correctly. If you have a healthy self-esteem and you see yourself the way God sees you, and you have no problem with, with who you are in Christ, you don't have to prove yourself right over anybody. Amen? I don't have to prove myself. I know who I am. Fight to win is very possible, especially when all logic and all truth is on your side. But the fight to win will destroy your family. It will destroy the relationship. There's no love in it. And that's a true principle in every relationship that I know of, okay? Uh, yeah, and Ellen says, but you really haven't won anything. James said, you know, some just love to fight. You're right, Ellen. You know, you haven't won anything. You've won the argument and you've lost the war, okay? In other words, you won the battle, but you lost big time because you lost the relationship. Now, it doesn't mean you should appease. It doesn't mean you should avoid, but fight to win is not the solution either. And guys, I watched it. I mean, people are competitive. We want to be right because our self-esteem needs to be proven right. If you really have self-esteem and you really see yourselves the way God sees you, you don't have to prove anything about yourself. You already know who you are and being right is fine but you don't sacrifice and destroy another individual to feed your own ego. Okay? Amen. Amen. Yeah. That can be especially bad with your children. Well, children's another another issue, you know. When I told my son he shouldn't run across a busy street, I was right, and by golly, I was going to control him. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole other issue with children. Okay? How about the fantastic fourth solution? Find a godly resolution. Number four. Fantastic four. I love it. It's fantastic. What is God's answer to this problem? How about praying? How about listening to God's voice? How about being led by the Spirit? How about find a biblical solution? Amen. How about it? Find God's answer. And guess what? His thoughts, according to the Bible, are not your thoughts. And his ways are not your ways, because his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And in Ephesians, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you could ever think or ask. Find a godly resolution. In other words, there's an answer that God has. He's not stumped by your family member. He's not confused by this whole situation. He's not lost, you know, without words. He knows exactly 
what needs to be done. Your job as a Christian who's led by the Spirit of God is to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and to reach out to God for God's answer to the problem. God may not want you to try to fix this person. He probably doesn't want you to avoid it unless he tells you to let go and not let him take care of it, which is very possible. He may do that. <laughs> that could be a solution. <coughs> it could be an answer. How do I put it this way? If I am dealing with an extremely difficult person and I don't want to avoid it, I don't want to appease it, and I don't want to fight to win, I want a godly resolution. It, don't be surprised if God says, I want you to turn this person over to me. I want you to let go and watch what I will do with this person. I want you to intercede for them. I want you to pray for them. I want you to do some spiritual warfare over them. I want you to pray for their heart. And then I want you to let it go and give that person over to me and watch what I will do. I've seen this happen many, many times. Okay. Now, let me say, give you some practical tips though. There are times you're going to need to talk to this person. So what do you do? You're going to have to talk to them. Okay. Any questions on appeasement, avoidance, fight to win, or godly resolution? And I want to say this. Everybody listening to me, you probably tend to fall into one of those four categories. Most people in conflict resolution will choose one of those methods. You could be an avoider, you may be an appeaser, you may be a fighter, or you may be the person that looks for a godly solution. And whichever person you are, I hope you become a member of the Fantastic Four, okay? Just don't flame on or stretch out or, you know, or be the thing. Just, okay, be a superhero for God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. What can you do? Now, God has said it's time to approach them. Ephesians 4.15 gives a biblical principle that is timeless. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head even to Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Speaking the what? The truth in love in love. Now, there's two things. It's not speaking the truth, okay, and hating them or resenting them or have unforgiveness in your heart, okay? It is speaking the truth, truth in love. How you like my little cloud thing there? In love. I need to speak the truth, but my motivation, my voice is loving, my heart is loving, my motivation is love, okay? Speaking the truth in love. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus not confront people? I mean, he confronted the Pharisees, called them whitewashed tombs. He told some of the uh, Jewish men that their father was the devil, okay? He said some really tough things, okay? He told the rich young ruler to sell all his goods and come and follow me. Rich young ruler wouldn't do it. Uh, you know, he, he weeped over Jerusalem. He said some tough tough things. He talked about the end times. He talked about men becoming lovers of themselves. He, 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 he really spoke some hard words, but you got to remember something. Jesus, the people he said these hard words to, he loved them so much that he gave his life for them. He went to the cross and gave up his life. He died for them. He showed them more love than you and I could ever even conceive of. Jesus poured out his love and compassion on the people he spoke the truth to. So he spoke the truth, but he was full of love. Can you do that? Can you do that with your family member? Hmm? That's my question. Can you do that in resolving a family conflict? Can you speak the truth not to prove yourself right, but to be a servant and because you love them? because you care about them. That's the motivation. Now, that's easier said than done. 
but you have a right to express your feelings. You hear me? Your feelings are true. There's no such thing as a false feeling. Let me say it again. Feelings are what they are. You feel what you feel. Now, many times our feelings are based on a lie. Our feelings could be based on a, a bad perception, but your feelings are your reality. And I've said this in counseling and teaching for many years, never, ever, ever tell somebody they shouldn't feel that way. That is an insane, that is an insane statement. It's insane. You're telling me I shouldn't feel the way I'm feeling, but I do feel the way I feel. But I shouldn't feel what I'm feeling, but that's like telling somebody you shouldn't think, you shouldn't have a brain, you shouldn't have a body, you shouldn't have hair, you shouldn't have ears, you shouldn't have a nose, you should not have an arm, you shouldn't have elbows. I mean, whatever, it's, it's just part of who you are. So your feelings are valid, even that, however, sometimes they are based on something that's not true. Okay, and then Jim makes a comment. Uh, speak with First Corinthians thirteen, four and seven in mind. Yeah, the love chapter. Absolutely, you have a right to express your feelings. Your opinion matters. Now, this is a word for somebody here. Okay, your opinion matters. It matters. This is something that's that's really big. The the controlling, dominating. Uh, person in the family who's causing the conflict and causing the issues will try to convince you your your opinion doesn't matter but I will tell you something your opinion matters to God your thoughts matter your words matter your thinking matters your resolution matters your emotions matter your mind matters your words matter they're very important to God the devil will try to convince you that you do not matter you're not valuable you're not legitimate uh, your opinion is worthless. No, your opinion is your opinion. It matters to God. And it matters to your family. You hear me? Um, Ellen has a comment. She said, I had one guy tell me years ago after we broke up that I had a right to be hurt, but didn't have a right to be angry. What a jerk. <laughs> That's like, you can't feel. You have no right to be angry. Well, wait a minute, but I am angry. Well, see, that's insanity. That's just crazy. That's like telling a duck, you shouldn't have webs, webs on your feet. But I'm a duck. I'm sorry, you cannot have webs on your feet. I mean, it's just, you know, your feelings are there. It's, it's, it's reality. You don't deny people's reality. Okay. Amen. Uh, Nina says, is it worse if it is allowed to go on for years? Well, it can be because resentment can build, unforgiveness can build. Um the person can uh, get more, uh, the behavior can become more of a stronghold. Yeah, it could be worse. It really could. You know, it doesn't mean God cannot resolve it, but it can make it more difficult. When you're dealing with a troublesome person, speak your opinion and express your feelings with love. Now that sounds easy, but it's not. Because we want them to stop what they're doing. We want them to receive our words. We want them to care about what we're saying. We want them to see, you know, how bad the behavior is and, and how this thing needs to change. But here, see, that's all expectations. Your job is to speak your opinion, express your feelings with love. Expectations can get you in a lot of trouble because you're expecting when you are expecting a particular response and you do not get it, then you're going to be disappointed. And so if you kind of cool it with the expectations and just speak the truth with love, express your feelings, knowing that your word matters, and then let God do what he needs to do. Let me tell you something. They may receive you. They may reject you. They may laugh at you. There's no telling what they will do, okay? But you see, your love is your motivation to resolve this conflict. Your job, your responsibility, according to the Word of God, is to speak the truth with love. What they do with those words is their responsibility. Hear me carefully. This is very important. What they do with it is their responsibility. Now, see, 
I have a family member that I want to correct and fix and make them not act the way they act because I don't like the way they act because I don't like the way it makes me feel. So I can tell them exactly how I feel. They may receive it. They may not. They may reject it. They may get mad. I don't know what, the, what they're going to do, okay? But if I speak it in love, at least the words have been put out into the atmosphere. The words have gone into the gates of their ear. The words have gone into their spirit, and you have planted a seed. Now, they may openly reject it, openly ridicule it, or argue with you, but the seed has already been planted. Think about that. Your thoughts and your words are your responsibility, okay? Does everybody agree with that? My, my brain is my brain, and it's not Jim's brain or Nina's brain or Liz's brain, okay, or Steve's brain. Although sometimes I wish I had his brain. He's got a really good brain. But my brain and my thoughts and my words are my job. Your thoughts and your words are your job. And that's the way God, God holds it. God holds every person accountable for their own actions and words and thoughts. I am not accountable and I am not responsible for Steve's words, his actions, his thoughts, or Jim's, or Marsha's, or, or, or Nina's, or or Liz, or, or Linda, or Dolly, or uh, uh, Zana, Zana, oh, I got your work name. I'm not responsible for your thoughts. Now, I want you to think nice of me. I want you to like me. I want you to care about me. I want you to enjoy this webinar, and I really hope you do. But you know what? That's your responsibility. What is my responsibility? Right now, my responsibility is to teach this lesson and to, and to, to discuss this with you guys. That's my responsibility. And the same thing goes with conflict. My responsibility may be to speak the truth to this person with love, regardless of how they react, and not expect anything. And if you drop the expectations, if they receive it and say thank you, then hallelujah. But if they don't receive it or have a, a bad reaction, well, it's okay. You really weren't expecting it anyway. You understand? <coughs> Watch the expectations. All right, okay, um, let's move on. The troublesome family member is responsible for their thoughts, words, and actions. So get the principle. You are accountable for your words and your actions. They are responsible for their words, thoughts, and actions. You know, you would think this would be such a simple principle for people to understand, but I, I, I really think many times three-fourths of the people in the world do not get this. I hear so many times, well, they made me do it. He made me say that. Really? They, you know, but, but they did this. Let me tell you something. No matter what happens, my actions are my responsibility. My reaction is my responsibility. My words, how I react to a, a, a unruly person, how I react to that family member is my responsibility. How I treat them is my responsibility. How what they say, what they do, how they react, what they say, how, how they, uh, if they want to continue to act ugly, continue to, to mess up the family, continue to cause problems, God's going to hold them accountable. But if you don't treat them with love and maybe speak the truth to them and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, God will hold you accountable. But you're not accountable for them. They're not accountable for you. That's where it gets all messed up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jim says that's a discussion we'll have with God on Judgment Day. Steve's got a novel, I mean, a question. Um, it stands to reason that if you're not responsible for another person's choice, then neither are you responsible for the consequences of that choice. So should you just stand by and let the person go through the consequences, or should you step in and minimize the consequences? That's a good question. Typically, the normal rule of God is if it's a natural consequence of behavior and it's a responsible adult, you should let them suffer their natural consequence. You should let them experience the natural consequence. And the reason I say that is because God works through that. But if you continually rescue people and keep them from suffering or experiencing a natural consequence, Many times you're you're robbing them of a life lesson that God may be trying to teach them. Um, it's just 
it's just a natural consequence. Um, I like the story, uh, maybe a, a real simple example of this. There's a story of a pastor, a church member came up to a pastor and said, Pastor, can you loan me $200? I'll pay you back next Friday. The pastor said, sure. So he loaned the young man $200. Several weeks went by. The young man never paid the pastor any, never paid the money back. As a matter of fact, this happens a lot in churches. So a few weeks later, the young man comes and said, Pastor, um, I need another $200. Could, could you loan that to me? And the pastor said, no, I won't do that. And he said, why? You're judging me. And the pastor said, no, I'm not judging you. I'm observing you. I've observed that the last time I loaned you money, you said you were going to pay it back on Friday and you didn't do it. So according to that observation, I'm not going to loan you $200 more. It wasn't judgmental. It was just allowing the young man to suffer a natural consequence. You borrow money, don't pay it back. You don't get to borrow money again. That's a natural consequence. Um, you say ugly things to people. You hurt people. You, um, you hurt people's feelings. You cause difficulty. Uh, these people may not want to be around you. That's a natural consequence. Okay? Amen. I have a family member now that I love, I love very dearly, but I have to minimize my time with them because, you know, they're, they're, they have some control issues and their personality is kind of toxic. And, you know, one thing I can do is I love them, but I don't have to spend a whole lot of time with them. Now, it sounds hard. It doesn't mean I don't love them. I do. You are not responsible for the other person's thoughts, words, or actions. Amen? God holds you completely accountable. In 1 John, it says, if you, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you from uh, forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It didn't say, if you confess your family member's sins, it says, if you confess yours. In other words, you are responsible for you and they are responsible for them. That is the essence of boundaries. It's knowing where you end and they begin. Okay? Amen. Now, why is this important? Because when you, once you get this down in your spirit, it allows you the freedom to confront this family member and say, your opinion matters, your feelings matter. So maybe once you have this in your spirit, you can go, you know what? I'm not responsible for how they react, but I am responsible for, for what I need to do. I'm just going to tell them the truth and love them as much as I can and pray for them. I'm looking for a resolution here. Okay. All right. After speaking the truth in love, you have choices to make. Okay. What can you do? You spoke the truth in love to this troublesome family member. If they reject your opinion or respond with anger, you're free to set healthy boundaries. You're free anytime to set healthy boundaries. But if um, I was around a um, person in a room with a person a few weeks ago and they were upset with another person and they were yelling and screaming and saying ugly things and... Uh, I set a boundary and I looked at them. I said, you know, I really don't want to talk to you right now. I don't want to be around all this anger, angry words and yelling. And I just walked out of the room. Okay. Uh, interesting. And, and I guess they thought I was going to come back. I did not come back into the room. And about 15 minutes later, they found me and deeply apologized. But the consequence was, if they were going to yell and scream and say ugly things, I chose to leave. <laughs> you know, hey, great. I'm not going to hear that. Thank you. It's just a boundary. So you can set a healthy boundary. I know it's not always easy with family members, but if they're being, you know, offensive and they're being ugly, you know, you, you can always get in your car and leave. You can go in the other room. Um, if it's a, if you're a situation, you cannot escape, you can stick it out, but kind of not make any further appointments with this family, I mean, with this particular person, there's things you can do. Now, if that's not the best, God wants to resolve the issue. You cannot force someone to come into agreement and make a change, but you can make your own personal decision 
for a change. Amen? For a positive change. In other words, I cannot force them to change, but I can realize I'm valuable, I matter, and I can speak the truth in love to them, speak like Christ to them. Let me tell you something. If I have some real good friends in my life, my friend Jim Drake is a good friend. I believe Jim Drake, if he saw something in me that he didn't agree with, I believe he would love me enough to confront me on it, okay? And not just tell me anything that would make me feel good. I believe he would confront me and tell me the truth, okay? Because that's what true friends do. So you can make your own decision. You cannot force them, but you can make your own decision for a positive change. God holds you accountable for your words, your actions, and your reactions. Your attempt at a godly resolution is your responsibility. Okay, let me just get this, make sure you get that straight, okay? Your godly resolution is your responsibility, okay? I can't draw too well. That is your responsibility. Do you understand that? You're a Christian. Looking for a resolution is your responsibility. Now, even Jesus could not come to a resolution with everybody around him. Do you remember when he was in Nazareth? He upset the crowd so much, they took him to a hill, and they were going to throw him over a cliff. Well, the Bible says Jesus just walked through them, parted their ways, and walked through them. He was not going to allow himself to be abused. He was not going to allow himself to be thrown over the cliff. Look at it. I think it's in Matthew chapter 18. Okay. Or is it chapter 15? Maybe 15. Um, but our job is to attempt a godly resolution. Their reaction to your attempt is their responsibility. The th problem, honestly, I run across is, is I get nervous around angry people. I don't want to be around angry people. So sometimes it makes me a little, I'll be honest, makes me a little chicken because I don't, I don't want to hear the angry words, and I know if I tell them the truth, they're probably going to get mad. But you know what? That doesn't excuse it. That doesn't excuse it, okay? Got a uh, couple of comments here. Uh, James said a few minutes ago, how fast can I run? Amen. Alan says, sounds like the yelling and screaming person did that as a child and got away with it and became a habit to get her way as an adult. I wonder if they even realize what's going on. Or Steve's responding to Ellen, perhaps the person never grew up and is still a child throwing a temper tantrum. Well, that's very that's very possible. I want to tell you something. Uh, people with control issues use anger as their primary weapon. It's one of the biggest weapons of a controller. They know if they get mad, if they yell, they scream, people will comply with their wishes. And so they use that as a weapon to get their way. It's immature. It's unhealthy. Now, if you can ever get to the point where you say, you know what? I'm going to speak the truth. And if they get mad, they get mad. But whatever they want to do with it, that's their business. But I'm going to speak the truth to them anyway. Now, that's not easy because you know, you know, you, you may have a powder keg there. But if you can get to that point, uh, it's a very healthy point. But you have to really know. You may have to have some counsel, some friends, some reinforcement. But you have to know that, you know, you're just going to do your job. You're just going to speak the truth. You're going to pray for them. You're going to do your part. And if they get mad and they yell, then you're not going to take it personally. You're not going to let it upset you. You're not going to let it bother you because you know that that's their words. It's their thoughts. It has nothing to do with you. It's their business, not your business. If you can get that attitude, you can confront them. However, it may take you a while to get to that place. So be careful. You know, pray about this. Have some counsel about this before you go confront that really, that really tough person. Amen? Amen. All right. Never try to mix your responsibility with someone else's responsibility. Okay? Again... That is actually a picture of oil and water. It doesn't mix. Um, I, I've said things to people 
that they would get upset about, and I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe they got upset. I mean, like, how did they get upset? And I immediately wanted to fix them. And, and sometimes you can. You can clarify your words. That's fine. You can explain yourself a little better. But ultimately, you have to just do your part, love them, speak the truth in love, maybe set healthy boundaries, and then let it go. And then just let it go. Let it go. And why is that? I want to show you something. You know, why, why is that? It's because of this. This prayer, sometimes there's prayers that are so familiar that we never really look at how truthful this prayer is. And this is known as the serenity prayer. And it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can and wisdom to know the difference. What can you not change? Or who can you not change? God, grant me the peace, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Some of the things you cannot change are people. People. Hello. People. You cannot change them. Okay? Give me the courage to change the things that I can. Myself, for instance. <laughs> me. Me. And let me have wisdom to know what I can change and what I cannot change. Amen? That's why that prayer is called the serenity prayer. You get peace with that prayer when you follow it. Um, Nina, Dr. Nina Garner, logged in as one voice, says this. A few years ago, after my dad passed, I wanted to do an appreciation day for mom to encourage her. I sent formal invitations to my family and said, no drinking, no drugs, no alcohol, or we would call the authorities. Those that typically disrupted uh, in violence chose not to show up. Perhaps this wasn't the best way, but my mother had a great day. She was ill and needed a fun day with me and my family. Well, I think that's great. I mean, I like the invitation. You know, no drugs, no alcohol, no drinking. I mean, okay, amen, amen. I think that's terrific. You just set a boundary on the front end. <laughs> you set a boundary as you got going. Amen. So, in conclusion, I know it's not easy, the family conflict, because there's so many emotions and there's hurts and there's wounds. It really takes a lot of courage to confront that that family member it, it really does take a lot of courage i wouldn't do it without praying and asking god for his direction and maybe talking to your pastor or a leader and, and maybe even working with how you're going to package your words but if you can come to the point where you you know i'm just gonna do my part i'm gonna speak the truth because i love them and i want to serve them and i really want to see God resolve this problem. And I just want to be a messenger for him, a servant of God. And I'm going to take that attitude. And then if they receive it and, and, if, and they do something with your words, hallelujah. If they reject it, get angry, through a fit, well, you know what? That's their business. God will judge them. But even if they seem to reject it, they actually have not. As a matter of fact, when people get angry, it's usually when the word hits a nerve. You've actually hit a nerve, so to speak. You've actually hit a sore spot. You probably, you probably nailed it. But once you speak the words into the atmosphere, they're there. They're out there. You've done your job. And you can bless them. And you know, it's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus spoke the truth. Many people rejected his words. Many people got angry with him. And he loved them anyway. But he did his part. He spoke the truth and he loved them with an incredible love and he served them with his own body on a cross. You know, I, I can't be, you know, I don't know if I could ever be as effective as Jesus. I don't think I could ever come close to that, but that's what he did. Amen. Uh, Ellen said, in the right time when no one gets upset, and Nina said, uh, after after family events, when things didn't go well, should there be questions among the family members so how we could change for the next event? I think that's, you know, 
you had a family event didn't go well, maybe, yeah, I think if the family would get together and talk about what we could do different. What's really cool about problems and issues is they show another way. You know, if it weren't for problems, we wouldn't know. If it weren't for what's wrong, we wouldn't know what's right. Take the law of Moses. The law of God showed us what's incorrect so we know what is correct. <laughs> Amen. So looking at your problems, to me, is a great way to find solutions. Amen. Any other questions or comments? I really appreciate you guys uh, logging in tonight. Jim, I'm glad your foot is better and your testimony. Liz, thank you for being here. It's always good to see you, Liz. And um, thank you, Dolly. Hello, Dolly. Looking swell, Dolly. Hello, Linda. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Zana Marble. Appreciate you very, very much for being with us. I mean, any final questions or comments? All right, I love you guys much. I hope this was helpful. We um, are still working on doctrine of, uh, excuse me, worship that touches the heart of God. We're coming up to week five, I think, with that. A couple more weeks of that. Then uh, that's the Tuesday night class. Then Steve's doing a hot topic on uh, called Day of the Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. I think that's the 20, is it the 27th? I forget, Steve. 27th, I think, Day of the Walking Dead. And then... Uh, I think two weeks after that, or a week after that, I, have to look, I will send out an email on it. We're going to be doing um, teaching on the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. Six weeks on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeehaw. Amen. Well, oh, got a comment here. Okay, thank you. 27th, thank you very much. Good stuff. Thanks. Linda Jessen, thanks for the good teaching. Dr. Self himself. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, well, Lord, thank you for this class. Lord, if we have, listening to us, people with family members that need to be confronted, that we need to, to resolve this conflict, Lord, I ask you that you would give us the wisdom, your wisdom, how to come to a godly resolution. Lord, if we've been avoiding or appeasing or fighting to win, I ask you, Holy Spirit, just to convict us and show us by your grace and your word how you would have us to resolve that problem. Lord, give us the courage to do our part. Lord, give us the, the wisdom to know what we can change and what we cannot change. Father, we give you praise and honor for tonight. And thanks for each person listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 All right. Thanks to you, Liz. Appreciate it. Give a look, say hello to Pastor Jerry and Denise. And love you guys very much. Thank you so much. Dolly, I can't wait for you to enroll in our Christian Counseling Certification Program. That's another announcement, by the way. We started a certification program in Christian Counseling. Uh, the details are online. It's just if you're interested in a certification, love to have you. Amen. And as we always say, good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Grandpa. Good night, Grandma. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, America.